All right, we can kick it off. So, um, my name is Daniel Buckner. I work for Block. Uh, TBD specifically is the subword. Um, we uh, published a white paper a couple years ago now. Um, TV Dex is a thing we're building. One of the underlying things we're, we're building to get there is this uh, thing we're calling Web5. It's a funny name. I'll tell you a little bit about it and what it is and the fact that we're you know now delivering it. Um, this is a very early preview, so we have, do have some workshop with some active demo stuff, but understand that this is like a lot's gonna fly into the code base in the next 20 days in advance of Bitcoin Comp. Um, so what is Web5? It's a decentralized web platform to kind of update the web to have some of the features that it doesn't right now to be a truly decentralized platform. Um, 16 years ago, browser vendors published the first draft of the HTML5 spec. I don't know how many people remember that. I mean, there's, there's a few older people in the room. I'm 40, so I, uh, I worked at Mozilla at the time when we were working on Web5 or HTML5, and it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Um, all the browser vendors kind of came together. Uh, Google really wanted to, Google, Mozilla, and Opera really wanted to see the web be more of a, an application medium. At that point, it was still very much you know, information um, retrieval, documents, stuff like that. Um, HTML5 was not all about HTML. Uh, it brought powerful features to the web that went way beyond HTML. And I, I think you kind of remember these things, right? Like geolocation was part of HTML5, and local storage, a website being able to store a little bit of data um, locally was part of H HTML5. Um, so it, it went far beyond. It did augment the experience of the websites you could use, and you, know, you can make more app-like websites, but it was mostly centralized, right? It was mostly giving websites power to do things within their own sphere. It wasn't was advancing the individual in really many ways. Um, and over those last 16 years, since HTML5 was you know, ratified as a specification, uh, centralization of the web has become a serious problem. And I think we can all see that across the spectrum today. So the idea of, H of Web5 is that we need a new effort uh, on par with HTML5 to restore the web to what it was envisioned to be. And that requires a set of technologies to be deeply embedded in the browser and just the web context that allow people to build apps that are just different and model very differently than centralized apps of today. So what, what is the web we want, right? The current model is you throw a lot of your data up into these various applications and sites and that's, uh, you know, I mean, they love it. Um, and, and people get value out of it. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it, it's not yours anymore. A few of them have any viable export formats. Um, most of this stuff is, is trapped in silos and they, they fiercely guard. And I think we want a web that's, that's a little different. I think we want our financial interactions, our personal and social communications, um, personal data, it could be our medical data, it could be anything, anything of that sort. We want it to be under our control um, and, and protected in private. And that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do with Web5. Um, so apps that primarily store their data with you, not external, um, pure communications that can happen directly and encrypted, and the API is baked into the, into the web browser to do all these things. So what is Web5 made of from a technical level? So what is this even? Um, the centralized identifiers are, are the first pillar. So we, today we have usernames and passwords and emails and all those other things. Some people have you know, NPUB keys, I guess, uh, for Noster nowadays. Um, but a lot of these things are either completely centralized or, or are not really on a track to be something that's standard across the web. We really want it to be a part of the web. Um, DIDs are an international standard. They were ratified through a painful process in the W3C that saw uh, major browser vendors uh, you know, arguing not to have them ratified due to proof of work and things that, that were being brought up about blockchains and all that stuff. Um, but we made it through Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who created the web originally, stepped in and basically broke the tie and said that these things are going to be a part of the browser. And, and that's awesome. We have a standard now for IDs that you own. Um, cool, cool note here is that a DID is really just like an address. It looks very similar to something like an NPUB. And in fact, um, Nostra could represent their keys in a standard way through did key. There's actually a, a type of DID that looks just like a public key. And at that point, they could interoperate with tons of other companies, right? And still get to have their, their thing. Uh, the second pillar is verify, verifiable credentials. And I know, you know a lot of people in the stream, I, I don't like credentialism in the sense that, you know, that that's an, a dirty word. but Verifiable credentials may invoke a sense of like of formality with you, but it, they shouldn't. All a verifiable credential is is sort of a, a cryptographic container format that you can uh, use to represent any assertion by or from one party about another, right? And that assertion could be anything. It could be you rating a restaurant. You give it four stars, right? That's a verifiable credential. You're signing it with your DID with its keys and you're saying, this is what I believe about this other ID, which happens to be a restaurant. 
could be a, uh, a school giving a diploma away, right? Encapsulating this format, signing it with their DID, and saying that you have this, uh, this educational background. Um, so verifiable credentials aren't attached in any way, like specifically to governments, although governments are now using them as their format um, for things like driver's licenses and that stuff, but they're completely agnostic to whatever your use case of trust is. Um, and they are decentralized in the sense that a verifiable credential is only as good as you believe it to be. So you're not required to trust anyone's credentials. You could just say, hey, I don't really trust the signer of that particular credential. And so everyone's view of trust is different, and you might trust certain issuers uh, differently than other people. And the last one is decentralized web nodes, and these are really where most of the action's at. Um, these are personal data stores. The concept of personal data stores is about 20 years old. Uh, we haven't had great technology for about half of that time, and really just recently in the last five years have many different groups been participating on building something like this. Um, a personal data store is something that stores all app data, can, can do you know, direct encrypted uh, peer sends, everything you could imagine. Um, I, I usually liken it to almost like an open source, more decentralized version of Firebase. Like that's kind of the goal, right? Um, so these are the three pillars of Web5. These are the technologies we're working on. The first two are already international standards, like I, like I mentioned, by the same body that standardizes web technology for browsers. And the third one is the, is the, the most new and the one that we kind of just are finishing work on right now uh, in advance of Bitcoin Comp. So when I go through DIDs, like they have all these properties. Um, I'll give you a couple examples of how they're different. Um, so different from other types of IDs, even semi-decentralized IDs like Nostra Keys, for instance, um, you can find them. They're a globally resolvable state. It's kind of like DNS, right? You, you look up a you look up a domain name. It's going out to DNS. It's looking up the backing name servers and finding content. Uh, a good DID method. There are some out there, uh, based some based on Bitcoin. Uh, have the ability to look up a DID and route through a decentralized routing table. So instead of something like DNS and ICANN, which is a centralized hierarchy, um, you have networks that are layer two networks that can resolve paths to places where you should find stuff. So instead of going on directory websites and doing all this like in-hand coordination or going on your Twitter um, and, and posting your decentralized social on the centralized social, you could just give someone a DID. And because they're resolvable on a decentralized global routing table, uh, you don't need any in-band communication or for anyone having pre-awareness. And that's a superpower of DIDs. Um, they're universally discoverable, even though they are pseudonymous. So every type of identity, even like NPUB keys, are pseudonymous. Bitcoin addresses and wallets too, right? If you show someone a public key, that's an identifier. And if you sign things with it, it's associated with it. Um, no difference here. Just because they're in an index and you can globally resolve them doesn't mean you have to give parts of you away. All of the ideas is kind of a big garbled string you know, attached to some keys. So nothing about this is saying that you know, you have to publish your human self, right? And that you can't have anything correlated to a DID that you don't disclose to someone. Um, verifiable credentials, I kind of walked you through it. Um, this, this standard is actually deployed right now by some very large companies. You may have seen um, one announcement that Microsoft had, they're doing work with LinkedIn and they've got an integration going where LinkedIn is now accepting employment proof and educational proof credentials. You know, uh, school says you graduate somewhere, an employer says you used to work for them, now this is verifiable. Um, it's a great way to get rid of bots, and especially in the age of AI, like we need things to be more trustable. Uh, and that's exactly what, what these companies are doing. Now, I, I worked for Microsoft for, for many years working on this exact project, and you know, there's lots of things I don't like about Microsoft, and mostly it was there because I had the opportunity to work on this stuff. Um, but it's a big deal, right? I mean, this is actual decentralized web tech being rolled out by some by the largest software company that's ever existed in, you know, on the planet. So I, I think that's a huge sign. I'd love to see more people jumping in on these things. And as Bitcoiners, we can you know we can have credentials for completely different things than, than all of those companies have use cases for. Um, this last one, you know, the detail of it, these decentralized web nodes, universally addressable. So if you know someone's DID, it means you can look up the instances of their data store. Right? So it's not a, a global relay publication medium. It's more like I have a um, DWN D-Web node on my local devices, and I might have a couple outbound remotes, but it's not like a giant network where all your data is thrown everywhere. It's more, it's more tight. Um, so someone who looks up your DID can find where your instances are. So get a direct connection. Like you might have one that's actually hosted at a large cloud. Um, I wouldn't fear uh, the data is encrypted that you want to be encrypted. So the most that they're really doing is, is sort of acting as a CDN, as it were, or a relay to you. Um, and it has 
different features like replication. Um, DWeb nodes are a masterless system. So even if you hosted one, say up on, let's say it was Google Cloud, um, it doesn't mean that that's like your controlling instance. They're designed to be masterless and distributed. So if you commit something here, it's just replicated to your other uh, instances and devices. Um, and it, it, it's, they're secure. So they have built-in um, built encryption based on the same keys that you're using for your DID. Uh, and that's something you can electively do. And you can also publish things that are unencrypted. Uh, a lot of data that we want to publish from your, you know, a node like this is not encrypted. It's like social communications or maybe it's a set of pictures that you actually want to be exposed. Um, and the other thing I'll note is that you don't just have to have one DID. In fact, we encourage people not to. Uh, we're working on a wallet based on Electron, uh, de first desktop wallet that you, you probably see at Bitcoin Comp, and it starts life and gives you three DIDs just to begin with. You can create more, but it gives you like career, social, um, and personal, and encourages you through that metaphor to use those DIDs in those areas of your life so that you're separating what you're doing, right? Um, the whole principle of DIDs is, you know, if you're being really uh, privacy conscious, is you would use a DID with every connection you make. Like I might meet someone at a conference and I generate a new ID, give them that ID, and that's our channel now. Um, so you're separating context and not, not correlating everything with one identity. Um, same thing with DWeb nodes. They can house the data of multiple of your DIDs, and, and the, the, the host, if it is hosted, doesn't have to know that, it's, that all of them are yours. So the topology kind of looks like this, putting this all together. Um, if you have a DID, uh, there's this thing called a DID resolver, which ingests a DID. It's just like DNS bind, but a decentralized version. Um, looks up, the, you know, you look up the DID, you get the pointers to say, you know, Bob's uh, remote DWM, this might be housed at, you know, cloud, or it could be your house on a static IP, it doesn't matter where. Um, she can send a message straight to Bob, it doesn't get ping-ponged everywhere, it's not like IPFS or some of these other like, publication networks, it's directly to Bob, it's encrypted to Bob, um, and all of these, these functions are part of the platform. Um, so what is, like, visualizing the Web5 stack? Um, we think at the top there's these things we call DWAs, and that might sound familiar. There's another word that I'll acquaint you with in a second. Uh, and those are the applications you build on the platform, right? You use all these underlying open source components to build DWAs. And then under that, you've got DWeb nodes and decentralized identifiers sort of underpinning the basis pyramid. Um, well, before we talk about DWAs, we should talk about what are PWAs. If you're not familiar with this word, it stands for Progressive Web App. Um, they're installable web apps. Every one of the devices you have in your hand today is capable of, have, of installing a PWA. Uh, you can test it out by Apple's little funny, uh, you can only do it through Safari. Uh, you can go to what's websites that took their vitamins, as they call it, um, are, are installable as icons on your desktop, and they have a, a representation inside your settings and everything. They look very much like regular apps. They open without a browser chrome around them. Um, and on Android, it's very easy. You can install them from just about any browser. Um, it's changing it's a, with the update of uh, iOS 14.6. So they are going to let third-party browsers on, app, on iOS now, and you'll be able to install PWAs from any browser. Um, but a PWA has all these cool features, like it's got a working offline cache with Service Worker and a bunch of other stuff that make them really great. Like you're going to start seeing web apps that are indistinguishable from native apps. In fact, Starbucks uh, has a fantastic one. It's, it's basically the exact same experience as the app. Twitter Lite, um, there's a few others. So what is a DWA? It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a shift. We're kind of shimming in some code um, to, with the service worker that instead of a PWA's normal, um, normal route, which is it, it's a website that talks to only its own centralized server and then it does some caching of, of that centralized server's uh, you know, routes and different assets, uh, what we're doing is inserting the DWN SDK, the DWeb node SDK in front of that so that your data is effectively, it just looks like a PWA, but it's storing the data with you in your DWeb node, right? And we're, we're sitting in there and making the cache more based off your personal data store, not a centralized server that's you know, some, some little remote. Um, so given an example, um, this is just an example of like a music app, something you could do uh, with DWeb nodes. You can write some records. It could be tracks, you know, audio tracks into one music app, uh, for instance, like an open source music app. And those are then synced to all your devices, uh, so you have access to them. And not just to that one music app, but another music app like Tidal, uh, which the company I work for builds, um, could acquire permission to that set of data, your music data, and then render the exact same thing, 
right? Like your playlists going everywhere. What we're trying to create is a more mashable web. It was kind of like a thing 15 years ago, and there's even a site that would give you like all these APIs and you could kind of mix and mash together. Um, but our thesis is that if we can shift a lot of data out of Facebook and all these things, there's gonna be a wealth of information that's secure and private to the user, then an app developer can sew together. So it's, you know, they're not siloed, they're having the full base of you, and you're giving them access to different parts of their of your identity, which lets them create new experiences. So, yeah, I just kind of talked about what's happening behind the covers. I do have a demo uh, that I'll show you right now of a music app. So this is a music app that we wrote uh, based on Web5. I'll add some songs real quick here to it. Um, songs. All right. Cool. So these were just right there. What happened was it took files off disk. It, it uh, uploaded them to the DWeb node locally. Uh, sync is coming. That is going to be there by May 18th. Uh, Mo actually wrote the sync protocol. We're just raising it into the API layer right now, uh, but it is there. Uh, so, so we can even play these songs, for instance. Uh, Um, Web5 just like is isometric, so we designed it so that it works exactly the same in the browser, in the node, in the electron, in the app native. Um, it, it writes to file right now. The default implementation is writing to level DB um, in node and other areas like that. And then it writes to uh, index DB with the value. And uh, you can marry it up to any database you know, if you scale these out with you build a few partner announcements. Uh, that we make at Bitcoin Conf of some very, very large companies that may be running these things. So, to kind of show you a little bit of this code to, to kind of go through it and uh, give you a sense of what I did um, to integrate DWeb nodes, which is here. So, this is basically a data store. Let me make it bigger. This is basically using a DWeb node, uh, setting up a protocol. You can create your own protocols in DWeb nodes, which is, is neat. Um, it's a little different than other systems, like for instance, Nostra has their kinds directory where you like, give everything a number like, with all these permutations, and then you go get it registered. Um, we we kind of created a semantic basis for data so that you don't have to go anywhere and register anything. You can just set up sort of your object relational structure and install it in the dweb node. And basically what I've done here is now my dweb node is educated, very simple protocol here. Uh, my dweb node is now educated about music. It understands that there's going to be these objects for tracks and audios and playlists. And when you install it, any other app that understands these same data objects and binaries in this particular format can ask for permission to just this subset of things and be able to render it. So it's not just the music app I showed you. If someone asks for this exact same protocol, access to say, you know, music, uh, they would be able to get access to this, just this subset. Um, writing data is pretty easy. Um, you know, like gets, it's, a, it's an object-based DB, so it's not REST. Uh, everything's sort of encapsulated in an object. Uh, the binary with it. Um, so you're to, to do queries, you're actually sending objects that evoke a, invoke a query. It's very RPC-like in that way. And we do that to stay transport agnostic. So right now it runs over uh, HTTP, uh, WebSockets is there. Um, we, we, have, we want to add other protocols, like de more decentralized protocols, like maybe hole punch in the future. Um, so these, these are just examples of you know what it's kind of like, like creating a playlist. It's very simple, right? You got your playlist, JSON object, your telling it what data format it is and other things like that. Um, let's see here. Go back to the presentation. All right, so the REPL, the REPL that you'll, you'll see is very, it's kind of dumbed down. So uh, bear with us, but let me go here. If you wanted to do this, uh, we basically have this quick start, right? And this quick start is linked in the, in the REPL. What it is, is just like, how would you get started with Web5 in five minutes? You know, I can blow this up and walk through a little bit. Um, and then I'll either take questions and people can try this stuff out. Um, you know, and then Mo can walk around and kind of help too. So basically installing, um, you know, importing this, the Replit has it. There's already a CDN link in the Replit, so you don't have to do any of this. We kind of skip this part. Um, but instantiating it in the context. Creating a DID is this easy. So you just kind of generate a DID. It generates keys for you endpoints everything with that. Uh, you can log that to your console even. Uh, they can run it here. That's a DID it just created if you're interested in what a DID looks like. Um, that's the format. And basically, 
the ion notation here is the method. So there's different DID methods. One of the simple ones I mentioned before is did key. And there's one for sub key keys. So there's like did, colon, key, colon, and then the public key. Um, and if you use that, you know, we could potentially see a future where uh, things like Nostra and others are compatible, right? Like we can all understand their structures. And they output this document, this ugly, ugly document here um, that has public keys in it. They're all JWKs. Um, there you see the set key. Um, and these things are, you know, the, the beauty of this is this output data structure is the same for every different type of DID, every different DID method. So it means that it's just like DNS zone files. Like when, you know, when your local web server goes and hits DNS, it expects a certain format of the return, you know, thing for name servers and for, for certs and everything. And this is the same thing with DIDs. We expect the same format back so we can interoperate. Um, so how do we associate this with our storage locally? Um, we have this did manager that's inside Web5. What this basically does is says, you can have an app that's as simple as some of these apps where they retain your keys inside the page, which isn't great, um, but you can do that. You can like just fire up the library and say, I'm, I'm gonna manage this did. Uh, typically we'd want people to be able to connect to a wallet and have the wallet manage the keys and then do the communication back to the apps. Um, so like for instance, the Electron app that we have, that's let's say a um, did management app, it actually, uh, enlivens itself with a server and a web page can connect to your uh, to your identity app and that's actually where your data is stored so that your apps don't actually have to store within their own pages anything whether it's keys or data um, they're essentially talking under the covers to those things uh, and, and the library manages all this for you so here's what we're doing you just have an in-page app uh, you're basically saying i'm registering the endpoint as myself is my own code context and uh, we, can, we can run that too so I've just stored the DID. This is actually running it actively on this page. Um, and then records create. So this is just like, if I'm trying to generate a record, a new, and a record is some sort of file, right? It, it might be JSON data, it might be plain text, it could be binary. We handle large binaries. There's a one little issue where we've got up to 11 gigabyte files, but you know, it's just like some tweak that we're making. So this thing will handle massive, massive loads of binary data. Um, and you just tell it what data format, content type, you want it to be here. And it takes streams, um, so you can you know push push whatever up, you know Blu-rays, what have you. Um, like you might write some test content in here, and there it is. So it outputs this this uh, file here, which has a descriptor. Uh, it sort of looks like a little bit of a message. Uh, the record is deterministic, so one of the cool things about DWF nodes is they are self-verifying. Um, there's no way you can trick them. The hash of this entire thing is basically the record ID, um, and it encapsulates everything from authorization to the data itself, um, and all of these little, um, these little items in here that, that kind of matter for queries. So that no, no two entries for a record could ever be the same. Like basically, if you get the same record, you're just, you know, the data store knows that they're identically equal and just drops one. Um, so reading records is pretty simple. The output of this method up here, uh, this record, uh, class instantiation outputs you um, the data if you just, if you literally just call data.txt. It, it's supposed to feel like fetch, uh, like web fetch, right? It has like .json, .txt, it's got array buffer, uh, you know, it's a raw stream if it's a large file, and do whatever you want, right? Basically, what we advise is look at the codec or the uh, you know, content type that you're expecting here, right? It might be a content type that's not natively served by the web and take the stream and run it through a stream processor. And that way you can kind of deal with whatever code you want. Um, updating records is really easy using that same output record from a create. You can just have a convenience method that says, look, all I want to do is just give me a new record entry and I want to change the text to, you know, hello, I'm updated. And I can say, like, you know, it's updated to, I don't know, it's not wrong, but, um, And that allows you to do like really quick in place updates. Uh, the entire system is a CRDT, so DWeb nodes are I don't know if anyone's familiar with CRDTs, but uh, conflict-free resolving data types, meaning that the system is naturally convergent. So when you push up data to a DWeb node, it, it's a very basic CRDT at the top level, but it will give you sort of the latest state. All your DWeb nodes talk in sync, and they all process information exactly the same way, and they output the exact deterministic state. Um, so it's kind of like a little bit friendlier version of Git, right? That's what CRDTs essentially are, if you're not familiar. Um, we do have other things coming post BitcoinConf, uh, something called commits. 
that allow you to have your own CRDT that allow for like massively multi-party apps where someone might be doing a Word document and you're like live editing it with 20 people and making that all convergent. So if you're all listening on each other's DWeb nodes, you, know, you have the ability to sort of leave a document together just like you would expect on Google Docs, but not centralized. Um, delete, I think I'm delete, but. Um, yes, for a summary, like if you were to follow this tutorial, you would have DID, you know, generate DIDs, you'd be able to register them with a the manager, uh, do all the basic CRUD activities, under the scenes, it does things like sync very soon, in the next like, 15 days. Um, and we also have encryption that we're leveling out. And the encryption story is kind of cool in the sense that um, you can, it's encrypted in such a way, uh, very, very much like derivation pathway in, in Bitcoin speak, but more about the semantic data where you can give people access to like, like I said over here, um, let me do this protocol. Like this protocol is tiered so that I create these like, you know, playlist tracks records. I could give someone just access to my audio, just access to my records or track based on this thing called CryptTree, which basically uses derivation paths to, to give people a descending like power over this. So if you wanted to give someone a private key, uh, asymmetric key associated with tracks that would get everything below it or records and get everything below that. So it's all built in. Um, to the protocol, and you don't have to really even think about it or think about any encryption. It just takes a key and does it for you. Um, yeah, so that's about all I had. If anyone wanted to try out uh, any of this quick start, uh, or I'm happy to just take questions up here. Mo's here, so if anyone tries to quick start out and gets stuck on anything, like he can help you. Um, any questions about any of this? Yeah, just sure. on the DID, just to understand it better, when you're saying generate it, you mean just on my local device in the application I generate an ID that at that point only I'm aware of? That yeah, so um, so there are different DID methods. The simplest one that everyone kind of uses in their hello world is like did key, because it's like it's literally just generate one of like five supported key types. There's like secp, there's um, ED25519, right? Like and just basically tack it on, right? And the, the document self-resolving in the sense that the resolution is the key itself, right? So you, it just transforms it in place. So you don't have to go register it outbound like in any network. So yeah, if you were generating like a did key, yeah, you just generate, just, gener just like generating any other SEPI key. If you're doing even did ion, um, the one that does have a network component, like a, a larger layer two, you can actually generate did ions locally. They're already, like you don't have to wait uh, to uh, register them or anchor them anymore. They're usable right when the, the keys are generated. Um, there are good methods that don't have that feature, like you, you must go outbound, um, but the ones we use are all, other than did web, there's a centralized one based on just having like your did doc on the website. Um, we don't advise using it, but companies tend to. Um, yeah? Um, are you guys thinking about any kind of like Zuko's triangle kind of stuff to give us like even readable? Name resolution. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, yeah. Human readable. It's hard. It's a hard problem. Um, Ion is scalable mostly because it doesn't do things like that by by default. Um, it's it's very hard to scale a name system. You usually need some sort of registry functionality and like expiries, and there's got to be people that compute and agree on a bunch of stuff. Um, so it, it's it's harder to do. But we are thinking about updating Ion with. There's this weird thing with it where technically every DID and ION has a, a short form alias, but it can't like be like a pet name system. Yeah, yeah, but, it, but it's, gen it's deterministic. It's not something where you pick it. Oh. Um, you can pick the last segment. There's like three words. Imagine it being like red car, fast red, and you have to pick car as the last one. The other ones are random. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can you can know ahead of time. It's like based on an index, and, and I'll talk through it. Every ION transaction in Bitcoin has an op return that falls somewhere in a block and then somewhere in the transaction index. So there's an implicit number that's there. Like it's kind of like the transaction number. And then every transaction has up to 10,000 DID updates. So every DID falls somewhere within that index. So if you took like, if you take a word list and just number them from zero to like 10,000, you basically are rotating through the word list, right? Like implicitly those numbers can map to words and you can triangulate which DID you're talking about, right? And then you can pick the last one. Which is like inside like, like the one you want. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not it's not it's about as good as you can get, but three words is pretty good, right? It's not it's not terrible. I, of course, no one wants to be called like brown stinky lobster or something like that. So, um, so you're not gonna plug in the name coin anytime soon. Well, the cool thing is like because it's gonna be based on a word list, you can actually kind of know ahead. Like this block is red, you know, the word red or something. And I guess people will maybe like try to be included in batches that are that fall there or something. Yeah, it's like you can kind of pick.
this might be uh, too basic of a question, but I'm, I'm still trying to just wrap my head. So if, if we, in five years, Web5 is the standard. So like right now, if I use something like Bitwarden, and I have a hundred different password email combinations. Like, do you imagine that I would have a wallet with a hundred dids for every single website, or do you think it would be more like I have three dids that I and I use those for all the different like, accounts? Like, would I is this going to essentially replace passwords and emails? Well, we hope so. Like, you know, when I worked at Microsoft, I worked on the identity and the security division, which is big. It's two thousand person division, um, but I worked mostly in yeah passwordless and. DIDs and DCs and stuff like that. Um, there's already you know standards right now, like Passkey, which is really just FIDO2. Um, just they just rebranded it, and for some reason people love the word Passkey now. Um, that that is a centralized thing that gives you the ability to say, well, this device has one key per website, and it's like locked, so now you don't need a password for that website. But it is also not helping you own your own identity. It's just literally giving people a more secure way to log into a website. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope in due time we, we don't just attack the password problem because that's still centralized, right? That's helping websites be more secure. We attack the, the username problem, which is really what DIDs are. Um, so yeah, in, in five years, I hope, what, I hope the paradigm looks something like this. Our wallet gives you three DIDs to start if you're not importing from the current state where you already have IDs. And those IDs, like I said, are personal, career, social. And we just do that because generally speaking, most people kind of divide their lives into like those three segments doesn't mean you can't make more IDs. Like if you meet a one-off app that you want to use, but you're like, I don't want to give it any of my like IDs that might have any sort of connectivity to me, I can generate one on the fly and give it to them, like a, a pairwise connection that's just for that app. Um, and then you're just using that. So anything siloed to that relationship. And so I think your DID manager is obviously, if you create these one-offs, it has to have that mapping. And yes, it does have to maintain that data itself along with your keys. It's sort of like maintaining some of the metadata maybe for your transaction history, right? You might want to keep that even though you can like regenerate your seed for Bitcoin. You might have other ancillary data that can't be regenerated from the seed phase. Um, so I think the role of agents, we call them user agents in browser land, is going to extend to DIDs and to these other forms of identity, just like they take care of passwords today. Now, you gotta pick a good user agent, you know, good, good wallet app for, for Bitcoin. Um, hardware secure, you know, the actual key material, but I think that's that's the paradigm that we're going for. Yep. Um, if a piece of data is stored in a full stack on network topology chain, self sort like data and web node, like all the way from like PWA to the DLB, on the other side, you have this whole different self sort financial payment we always thought was not worth by LSP, like. The two arm gets going together. Um, if that piece the macro picture together, I want to understand you know, what's your I guess take or macro view of how the future of all this would be that way. What what the value of cool? Or okay. How the future of business should. How do they interact together? That's right. Yeah, yeah. What, what value of cool? What so cool? one one that we're doing right now, maybe for the comments. I, I want to try and try and nail this music demo for the comments, but the one that we were thinking about doing is called uh, Palix, which is just if you have my did, uh, you can look up a, a known object protocol like Paylink. Um, it's just an, a JSON object where people can stick their public payment items. It could be like a Bitcoin address, it could be cash tag, it could be your bank and routing number, you know, whatever, whatever ways you want to get paid. That way you just have to have someone's did. You know, every way that they can get paid is there. And you can update it, right? It's a data store. It's not like a publication medium. This is your data store. So you can go and update that file and, and all that stuff's resolvable. So I can imagine in the future, I hope, when you are trying to pay for things with like friends or something at one of the, you know, like, it's like an event gathering, um, you're like, well, do you have Venmo? And what do you got? And it's like, oh, I, mean, I know everyone's in hyper Bitcoinization, everyone's got Bitcoin eventually, but. Today, right, if they're like, you're maybe with some no coiners and they're like, you know, I don't have Bitcoin, but they might have dids, right? And they might say, oh, well, here, let me scan that. And it's like, it just figures out between your two pay link objects like what you have in common. And then it makes like your life easier and it's just easier to pay, right? Um, that's, that's one way. And I could see gating content. We've actually talked to our Lightning folks that are on TBD. Uh, you might have saw some of the people that are doing the LSP stuff, um, putting in Lightning gates to some of this content. So if you had a personal data store and you're like, hey, I only want to give, I'll give some people permission for free access, but then other people will give permission and say, you also need to pay this lightning invoice. And then educating DWNs to understand how to verify um, that payment was, was made. Um, I can see that being in the crossover. Yeah. 
Sure. You're talking about access to like, oh, I'll give these apps access to my music and it'll include the playlist and then we can have multiple interoperable music players. But wouldn't you first have to get an agreement on what tag you're storing all of that data under and what structure it has? Super good, great question. So um, as you can see here, I've come up with my my ghetto my ghetto my ghetto uh, <laughs> protocol, ghetto which is music colon. And then some um, other player comes up with a different format. Yeah, no, that's going to happen, right? That's absolutely going to happen. It's a semantic problem. But here's the beauty of not doing something like a kind system: everyone can create their own sort of semantic graph and then encourage others to use it. The cool thing is there are actually um, some schemas out there that are really widely known. Like schema.org, I'll give you an example, right? This is what Google and others use to parse web pages, like you can put metadata tags in existing web pages, and they have a, a ton of objects that are already really well trod. Like these are used over you know, millions of websites already include this standard schema. So if I wanted to say, well, you know, what does a, uh, I don't know, let's, let's find something, what does a book look like, right? I can say, wow, this, this thing is used by, you know, Quite a few websites already. Google Books uses it. I think Amazon uses it. And you can kind of see how that's laid out, right? And so you don't have to start from zero. You can use something like this. Um, there, there's another great example of a schema. These are schema ontologies that are already there that you can mix and match and kind of put in your DWeb node, which are like GS1. A lot of people never heard of this, but GS1 does everything for supply chain. Basically, every company on the planet that sells anything is part of GS1. There's one schema in the entire planet for everything, containers, UPC codes, all the barcodes come from GS1. And so everyone uses the product object under GS1. Nike and all these other companies all use product objects. Now here's the insanity of it. This is why we kind of see DWeb nodes as like a Rosetta Stone. They all use product objects at the base of their data. And then they have access to the APIs through just random REST APIs they create. So they're actually speaking the same lingua franca, which is the data, you know, the, the way that they cast data internally. It's just projected out through a bunch of random APIs that each of their developer teams create. If you were to take your product objects as a company and push them into your DWeb node, right, and make them public, publish them, now you have a way to go crawl through IAM all the DIDs of everyone that claims to be a retailer and say, give me your product objects. And they know to ask for that because it's a very well-known schema, right? I know GS1, I know that's how people do product, right? So I go and ask every DWeb node with an efficient decentralized crawler that you could run right locally and say, give me all your product objects and have sort of the master series catalog of like what everyone's offering everywhere, right? And so that's kind of the power here. That's like what we're trying to get towards five years from now is having crawlers be inexpensive to create where you can crawl the did set on the layer two and then ask DWeb nodes like, hey, I'm a crawler for you know, products. I'm a crawler for secondhand sales items, right? And be able to, based on a small amount of code, iterate all of them and, and find that data and shape it up. And that's something that's really expensive. When I used to work with the Google team at, at Mozilla many, many years ago, um, they, they spent an absorb, exorbitant amount crawling the web. I mean, it is, it's, I think it's something in the order of $20 million a month just in server fees to, to cover 30% of the web. So they only, they only crawl about 30% of the web pages. Imagine if we lowered that crawl barrier down three orders of magnitude, where you could just find the DIDs that only are typed for certain things, and you could ask them specific semantic questions to say, like, give me products. Like, you could have so many more startups in the crawl space, right, that don't require a billion dollars of VC funding. They could write just a really small amount of code and sort of crawl this decentralized web. And, and that's at the end of the rainbow. We have a lot of work to do, but um, it's there. Kind of on the same vein, like if you put like schemas for data inside of like the docs and like resolve that, like if it says try like publishing it out of there. Okay, so so you're encouraged not to put anything in a did doc that's overly uh, identified um, because you don't you don't want correlation. Like you should try to minimize that as much as possible. Um, that's why we think data store is important because the data store actually does have shielded, encrypted, and you know authorized it requires authorization. So it's not just kind of leaking everything out there to everyone. Could you? Uh, yeah, there are certain places in a did doc that you can sort of stick things that inform people about who they are. In Ion, we do offer a type, a type field. So it's a small string field where you can declare a set of types. Like I'm a retailer. I'm you know very high. Like, it's not even a schema. It's just mostly a type index, and you can use that and, and crawl it. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna be doing it for DWA. So if you have a DWA, you'll get a did for your app, and then you register it on Ion as an app so that people can crawl Ion and find all the apps and then make their own, it's like a decentralized app store registry 
where you don't need to like go to Google Play or you know um, the App Store. You can actually just crawl in and find all the apps, right? Yeah. It's sort of like the not evil version of find all the mutants in the first set of X Men. I'm wondering about the like, um, like there's a race. It seems to me like there's a race of like, instead of the traditional um, way of storing cookies for the like, session data, um, one method for the centralized web is the RPC, like remote procedure call. Yeah. Um, do you, do you see there being a race between what your like what my five is that the architecture versus remote remote pre procedure calls because the way that the remote procedure call works, from my understanding, is that um, like whatever chain that you're using, 51% of the validators um, just have to make sure that like the data is like correct, and that can also work at in a CDN method. So, like I said, like you versus them. Like, so it's, it's very different. So when you bring up things like systems like blockchains and things like that that require consensus, it's just a completely different system than this. Like this is these are personal data stores. They're not. This is not replicated through 25 relays or a, a network of blockchain nodes. These are your data stores. So you might have like one or two that are remote from your devices. And really it's just for replication sake and the, the ability to ingest because this thing can't be online all the time. You get on a plane, like you want people to be able to like drop stuff off still, kind of like email. Like you can imagine your email went down when you got on a plane. Um, it's only a series of nodes that's relative to you, right? You might have like four, right? Like 200 devices, two outbound, maybe you got an umbrella at home. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have to come to any agreement on state either, right? This, these are your nodes. You are the agreement on state. Your DID signing and saying, this is the current state of my data store, is the definitive state, right? Like Alice doesn't need anyone else in the world to agree on what Alice's data is. Um, and that's the beauty here. You're not, we're not, getting, we're not involving blockchains in any way in these data nodes. They're literally just good old fashioned distributed systems, CRDTs, and some other things sort of mixed up right. Um, to, to create this centralized data storage. So I just want to ask another question. So, like you mentioned earlier, that it, there's there are opportunities on like taking your like Facebook data, for example, to this particular system. Could you talk about some of the like you know economic or like like business opportunities that you see in this space? Because I'm having trouble sure. envisioning when you know like you can get a lot of analysis from having a overall like big picture view of all the data that exists, but it's hard for me to imagine the, like the opportunities in the sort of business perspective of like how this could, like it's definitely valuable in terms of, you know, everybody's privacy, but I'm just curious, like, yeah, what yeah. opportunities you want? Well, yeah, let's talk it through, right? So after Bitcoin Comp, we're, we're going to be writing a uh, extension that people can load that basically drains centralized sources and up uploads uh, stuff there too, of nodes so they can have it be more useful, like people have, Data there that apps can, can write with give, give developers an incentive, right? If you have nothing there, it's, it's kind of hard unless you have to start from zero up. It's like a really sick experience. Um, so yeah, let's let's drain let's drain it from the places that it should be under your control. And then the question is like we've made like I wrote that music app and maybe like I don't know it, we are still writing the protocol at the time, so it was kind of like I guessed and checked a bit and ran some issues. It was about twenty hours where I probably could have done it in the eight, you know, if I if I did it over again. Um, so if you can do an app like that in eight hours, right? Like what does the financial incentive have to be? And that's just literally a PWA you can install from like GitHub pages. Right? I don't even have to have server infrastructure at all as a developer, I have no carry on cost. Um, so if you, if you look at it that way, like you don't need the same size of team or investment to be able to produce something because it just, like all those things that, like the true serverless, that's what we're really dealing with here. You, you have things like, Azure Lambda, or I'm sorry, Azure Functions and AWS Lambda, it's not really serverless. I mean, it's still someone else's computer, you just have to manage less of it. This is serverless. This is saying, well, look, I don't know where the user's data store is, I'm just asking for access to music. I'm not the wiser. Like, that's a very low bar on the development side. Now, if you talk about like the economics of like, well, how do data stores you know, deal with this, um, the data store economics are actually pretty good. Right? Instead of running some massive server in the sky that like, has a zillion messages needed at it from like, unknown sources and how do we pay for all these things, having this insane replication factor, um, these are curtailed. It's like paying for OneDrive, almost, if you did have an outbound node. Um, so it's much smaller um, traffic data. 
Now, how do people make money? You could be a service provider of the emeralds and for the outbound ones and make money that way. There's gonna be a Benary and a couple others are launching those services. We're talking to some traditional Bitcoin node operator shops that'll, that'll run them. Um, and then you have other really interesting opportunities, which are like ML and AI companies. So if you think about what ML and AI trainers need, they need structured data. Like that's really what you, you wanna train these models on. Now, there's nothing ethically wrong, in my opinion, with training on intentionally public data, right? If someone doesn't encrypt something to their dealer and they're intentionally, like a tweet or something or whatever else, I mean, they're literally saying, please look at my data, right? At least this part of it. So a lot of the data that people put into apps is intentionally public. It's for everyone to see. There's nothing wrong with training AI and ML models on that. Um, so the cool part about view opens is they force you to semantically you know, uh, articulate the data, which is kind of the holy grail for those systems, right? They want to go in and say, oh, I understand how this object relationship works. I can read it. It's deterministic. Like, it's, it's, and it's organic, right? It's coming from a real person. Um, so I think you could probably make money doing that. Um, in an ethical way. Um, so there's, there's many other models, but those are like a couple, I guess, examples. What are some uh, reference repos that I can look at for building like a WN server and creating endpoints and retrieving and writing data and all that? So the web5.js library actually, um, right here on NPM, uh, does, we, we basically made it a kitchen sink, I mean, you know, for, better, for better or worse, um, it's sort of a kitchen sink include, and this is the one that runs in Node, um, the browser. Uh, as you can see, it's in pre beta, so there'll be some changes in the next 20 days. But this guy has the ability to write to data storage, create the IDs, uh, act as a manager, all these things. We have um, the we have the Electron app, the management desktop app that we're going to open source here before the conference. It will be, you know, very much in an alpha state, so you know, understand that you're getting in sort of ground floor here. Um, and then we have a DWN server that Mo is just finishing up right now, which is basically the cool part. It's just web, this SDK wrapped with um, HTTP router and WebSocket router. So you don't actually have a lot of different code on the server. It just happens to need to listen over different transports. Yeah. Um, that's really all you're doing. Uh, so over the course, I guess, of years, I've like, looked at different things. Um, Semantic Web in general has you know, been a thing, and to whereas we again like the whole pods. Yep. Has there good. been any like learnings from uh, the past attempts to make the web more decentralized? Absolutely. So so I would say the differentiator between so solid pods for anyone who just doesn't know Tim Berners Lee created the web has a company called Interrupt. Uh, they have a platform called Solid, and there's this thing called Pods, and it's sort of like a personal data store. Um, there's that, and there's, there's actually many, many others, right? The, the, there's two issues with most of the other ones. One, they're, they're kind of centralized. A lot of them are not masterless systems. They're like, go get a host for your pod, and, in, and at the end of the day, the pod host can do tons of stuff to your state, it can like inject you know, bad data, do all sorts of things. So there, you're still, there's a high degree of trust. Or they're maybe based on IPFS. Like, IPFS is a good network. It's totally separate from Filecoin. They're different technologies. Um, but people base data stores on, which means like every time you write data, you're actually, you know, you're replicating it out to like every other node on IPFS. It's not a great practice. I mean, that literally wouldn't pass muster at like Microsoft or some of the bigger companies. They just don't, they don't allow things out of the boundary like that. Um, because, you know, it's just an issue. And people say, well, it's encrypted. It's like, well, if it's ever broken, then, you know, now your shit is literally everywhere. Um, so it's better to have authorization boundaries. What we did with DWAP nodes is make them truly decentralized. They're masterless. So like, Technically, the host, if you, someone was to host one of your DWM nodes, it has less power than the one that's on your phone. It's less powerful. Like it has no ability to affect your state. It's almost acting like a dumb facilitator and just like almost like a CDN, right? A little more advanced than the CDN. And so we did those things because it, like we looked around at the other projects and it just wasn't a good enough bar. Like it just, it just didn't have the properties. It gave up too much and too many of the hard things that made it more centralized than you would have liked. And this is a long time coming. I mean, this, this, this work has technically been in research phases for well before I joined Block, you know, for maybe like five, six years. Um, thankfully, we're finally done and we got the opportunity to do Jack to do this, but um, well, we, we like our chances, right? We, we think we're, we're up there with the best of the data stores and we have some really unique stuff uh, that people are gonna like. I'll go with the question makes sense, but are there DID methods that verify zero knowledge proofs? 
Yeah, so any did so the cool thing about dids, right, is like it has a section for keys, and you can add multiple keys. It's not even just second keys. I know everyone likes our second keys for Bitcoin's sake, but like second keys are actually not very performant for tons of things. Like for zero knowledge proofs, you typically want like um, twisted pair or you want um, very pairing funny curves. And like one is like a twisted Edwards curve or like a BLS 12381 curve, right? Like these are curves that are much more efficient when you're doing zero knowledge proof constructions, like orders of magnitude. Right? And so if you really were serious about building something on it, you'd want those keys. Well, the cool thing about DIDs is you can associate many different key types with the same DID. And that's, that's a cool thing. It's not like your, your ID is one-to-one -one with a key, which is like a really bad practice. I mean, like, not good. Um, so you can rotate keys in and out. You can have keys of different types, meaning that if I had like a BLS key on one of my DIDs, I could use that, for instance, for zero knowledge proof constructions that I want to do for various purposes like credentials, right? I see. So what if tomorrow some weird news you get emf that comes out? Can I just shove that in or do I need to does I need to come through W3C? No, so so the ZKP stuff is very separate. Like just think about these as composable pieces. Like DIDs don't under, don't know about VCs. They don't there's no actual technical um, overlap. You can use the keys from the DID to create a VC and then put evidence that it was created by this did, but technically the, the specs are separable. Okay. Um, so you don't, if you created a new ZKP construction, which you, which you want to do for credentials, um, you would you would most likely want to go and get it as a published JWK format, and that's that's with like um, that's with OpenID or, or or IETF, yeah IETF. You go to IETF and it's pretty easy. You say, hey, look, I want this like little identifier to be known as like this particular construction. And then your keys would be fine. They'd all be standard, just like all other JDKs. And then you'd probably do a signature suite on the VC spec, which is just a small little registry edition. You'd say like, hey, like I have a new suite. Like for so when people have this in their credentials, like it means this, and that's it. Um, those those are usually pretty easy to do. They take like a month or two, just because you gotta like show up on a call, talk to the open source people, you know, let them know. They're, they're not adversarial or against it anyway. It's just there's a little bit of a process because it's getting published out like by like major companies. It's a super good question. So um, I will show you something. This is TVDEX, like as you saw the, um, you, you saw TVDEX was sort of the white paper we put out. Um, we want to build TVDEX on Web5. So I'm actually just showing you, a, this is a mock version. It's kind of actually close to uh, the real one. What would a protocol look like if you were installing TVDEX? Like you were a user and you're like, I want to install TVDEX or, or a, a PFI, which is like the financial side of it, on my DWeb notes so that I can do these, these types of things. Well, this is what it would look like. You would basically write this into your DWeb node and you would say, here's like what a request, a quote, an accept, a payment request, like all of these things that, you know, that matter inside that protocol are, and you give the objects and schemas. And then this is the language in which you specify activity. So you actually install this in the DUEB node. What it means is that um, anyone can, like if you can kind of see here, anyone can create, anyone to create requests, right? What this means is that anyone can send this PFI request. It's almost like opening ports in the DUEB node, but semantically, you're like installing it and it's telling everyone else, I accept requests from anyone, right? And you can do this with different protocols. There's just different rules, right? Like this one's like close, like closing can happen from either party in, in the decks. So it says, allow participants to create a closed message. So it means that any DID that's inside the scope of this like context can invoke this close. Um, so this is like a, a neat little language, and this is you describing your app. Uh, the one I showed you is I was obviously much more simplistic. My, my, my token music app, which is like right here, it's the same thing though, right? And when there's no rules, it just means only the owner can do it, right? It's, it's allow list by default. Um, so yeah, this is this is what we're doing. We, we, we're starting to work on TVDEX now on top of this structure. So literally the TVDEX protocol itself is this file. That's that's the cool part about at the end of the day, we're not creating some one-off DEX protocol that has all these things and refigures stuff out. We're able to use the exact same data store and peer relays, and all that you need to do is install this, and your node now is educated about how to do TVDEX things. So that's, that's why I think it's kind of powerful, right? You can like architect any app um, in this sort of like deterministic language.